Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I see um, people coming in to the talk and we have a nice, wow, goodness. We're almost at 100 already. So I'm gonna start with my introduction so we can jump right in. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Katherine Heinz, Executive Director of New York City Audubon. And I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening for the last installment of our winter lecture series. Next month, we're going to have a special benefit lecture for New York City Audubon's Conservation and Science Program, a year with Pale Mail presented by Bruce Yolton. You can sign up for that using the link that Danielle is posting in the chat now and keep an eye out for an announcement in our egret email and in, on our website. I'd like to give a big thank you to Claude and Lucien Block whose generous support of the series has made this lecture possible, allowing us to bring you free talks on a variety of topics through the winter, even during this strange time. Um, it's really, really been great to see so many of you uh, through Zoom all these months. Tonight's talk is by Dr. Wen Fei Tong, author of Bird Love, which I just happen to have a copy of this beautiful, beautiful book. And she's also the author of Understanding Bird Behavior. Dr. Tong will be taking questions at the end of her talk, so please be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to send us any questions that you have. And now, if you haven't heard or seen the good news in the egret, Kevin Bergio joined us just two weeks ago on March 1st as our Director of Conservation and Science. We are thrilled and delighted to have Dr. Bergio on board to lead our research, advocacy, and programming. And I'm even more thrilled to introduce him to you tonight to introduce our speaker. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Catherine. I'm excited to introduce our guest for tonight, author and biologist, Dr. Wen Fei Tong. Dr. Tong started bird watching as a child in Singapore and would eventually go on to obtain her PhD in evolutionary biology from Harvard where she is a research associate. Dr. Tong spends appreciation, spreads appreciation for the natural world in many ways, through art, writing, and as a nature guide. We are so pleased that she's able to be with here with, here with us tonight. Uh, so Dr. Tong, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Kevin. Hi, everyone. So as Kevin said, I'm Wenfei and let me just uh, start sharing my screen. I know everyone's in New York City and the spring migration is about to start. So I thought I would kick off by showing you some sketches that I did um, last spring, just at the start of the whole COVID lockdown. And um, I, I live in Park Slope, so this is based in Brooklyn um, and, and Prospect Park, where I basically found solace every single day bird watching, like I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, okay, so uh, this is just something I started doing every day as a, as a way to document all the exciting birds I was seeing every day, but I'm sure a lot of you probably do the same. You, you go out every morning and you bird, and I just thought it was a really nice way to record some of the things I was seeing other than just taking photographs or, you know, because taking photos can be so stressful after a while. And I just wanted to point out that a lot of this, a lot of what you're going to see this spring is to do with bird love and mating behavior. So what my books try to do is to capture and explain some of the diversity that you see in different types of bird behavior. Bird love is focused specifically on different reproductive strategies, and the second book, Understanding Bird Behavior, is a little broader. So today's talk, I'll focus much more on um, the bird love bits of things, but I'll touch on some other aspects of behavior as well. And one, one disclaimer is I've mostly got uh, my own drawings or my own photographs in this presentation just because it's easier for copyright reasons, but these are not in the books themselves. So. Um, it's just, I just wanted to introduce myself a bit here. So, for example, um, you know, Kevin mentioned I grew up bird watching 
as a child. And I actually grew up really liking animals from a very, very early age, from as early as I can remember. And one of the things I've always done is associate people with animals and vice versa. And so this is just an, uh, an example from my PhD acknowledgements where most people have photographs of all the people they want to thank. And I didn't have photographs of the people. I tend to take photographs only of animals and scenery. And so I thought I would just um, draw people's animals for fun. And the one I particularly wanted to point out, a couple, was um, here on the top left corner is a satin bowerbird, which I write about quite a lot in both books. And I'm, some of you have probably seen lots of fantastic documentary footage on satin bowerbirds. They're closely related to the birds of paradise. And unlike the birds of paradise, they don't, the males don't show off their plumage and their dancing so much as their architectural abilities. And so they construct these bowers and they arrange all sorts of, the equivalent of almost like an art gallery or collection of museum specimens or something for the delectation of visiting females. And it's purely a courtship device. So there's a lot of really exciting um, evidence and exper very clever experiments showing that female bowerbirds don't just go for um, a particular showy male, they, they're quite discerning about exactly what the males are showing off. And they also prefer males that are more sensitive to their female's feelings. So if a male is a little too forward, she's liable to just bounce off into the forest and not give him a chance to mate. Um, and, and these females are single parents, but we'll talk about other birds that have a mix of different they, they mix it up in terms of who takes care of the kids. Um, and another couple that really inspired me, well, so Henry Horn was, um, I've made him a bowerbird here because he was a professor who was also very, very artistic. And um, I, I just thought that was a nice tribute to him. And on the bottom, you've got blue-footed boobies, which also feature a lot in my books. And that was another uh, pair of professors that really influenced me as an undergraduate, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who are best known for their work on Darwin's finches and um, documenting natural selection in the wild in these finches. But they've also done, especially Rosemary, has done a lot of very interesting work looking at how in the different Galapagos Islands, you have different song cultures evolving, and that has also contributed to driving speciation in these Darwin's finches. So that's enough about my background, as it were. These are just the two books, so you know what they look like. And um, I did a lot of research early on. I got my start in field work by going, getting to go to Kenya. And so one, one theme that has always fascinated me is why some birds, for instance, nest in groups and others nest singly. And so here is just a photo from the Impala research station where I was with Mount Kenya in the background and in the foreground in the acacia tree you'll notice that there's uh, festoons with nests and these are nests of grey-capped social weavers but the weaver birds of Africa and Asia are particularly fascinating and a classic example of trying to explain, use ecology to explain why some species tend to nest in groups while very closely related other species nest singly and those tend to be birds that live in forests or live in places where they eat food that's very hard to um, get en masse. So you tend to find fruit eaters, um, even though they're weaver birds, nesting singly and because they need a territory to guard to get enough food, they also tend to be monogamous. Whereas if you look at birds like these grey capped social weavers here, they're often colonially nesting and they tend to feed on grain, which is just, it's fine for a big flock to go and descend on the fields of grain. And then they often evolve all sorts of interesting cooperative social systems in terms of helping each other take care of the chicks. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Um, here's a grey cat social weaver close up on its nest. Another group of African birds that I ended up studying as a postdoc is these tiny grass warblers. And what you've got here is a nest in the grass. And 
you can probably just make out that there are all these tiny white filaments. Those are basically spider's webs. And this bird, which is called a zitting cysticla or rattling cysticla, has essentially stitched together or stuck together all these growing grass stems from the inside to form a kind of vase-like nest. And it nests right at the bottom of this structure. So it's a fantastic camouflage. And one of the main things I was looking at with these birds is uh, they are what we call hosts to a type of um, reproductive strategy that some birds have evolved called brood parasitism. And so it, uh, you know, I was interested in these nests because these birds sometimes get a, something called a cuckoo finch, an entirely different species, coming in and sticking its eggs in the poor cysticular's nest and then absconding. And when that cuckoo finch chick hatches, it essentially outcompetes all the cysticular's own chicks and becomes the only, the foundling and the, the only parasitic offspring of that brood. So we were looking at egg mimicry in these birds, but I just thought this is one of my favorite nests of all time because it's so beautiful. And here's an aerial view of it. So you can see right down into the bottom of the nest and you can see how, how carefully that bird has stuck these grass stems together. It's really incredibly hard to find these nests, but it's so beautiful when you do. This is a much more you know, close to home example of a nest that I found. Um, I used to go bird birding instead of in the New York parks in the Mount Auburn Cemetery in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I did my PhD there. And so one of the things I also talk about in addition to nest construction is just typical habits like nest sanitation that this robin is currently performing. It's just taking out a poo packet. Um, I think some of the other anecdotes I've gotten in the books are things like uh, how birds will use sometimes cigarette butts to, send, to, to try and keep lice away from their nests. That was one of the very cool natural history observations that people have tried to test. And sometimes they've got my, antimicrobial substances or they've got chicks that will produce projectile poo at predators. Uh, that hoopoos do that. That's a, there's an African and a Eurasian hoopoo species. And then also closer to home, this is another of my sketches from the last spring. I just noticed a couple of wood ducks investigating nest holes and being mobbed by starlings and found that very entertaining. Um, and you also find nests serving other functions, not just, not just keeping the eggs and chicks warm and protected, but also as a courtship device. So here we've got a weaver bird, another weaver bird species in Zambia, where the males essentially have to use the nests as a way to attract females. And so the males will build at least one nest and then flutter under it as a way to signal to females that this is, this is like a showroom ready for the female to come and inspect. And Quite often, if the female doesn't like the nest much, she just dismantles the whole thing and the poor guy has to start all over again. And needless to say, she doesn't mate with him. Um, and moving on from nests, there are, of course, lots of courtship signals and signs of attraction that I discuss. One of the ones that I find quite interesting in birds, because humans can relate to it, is this idea of um, female preferences or mate choice preferences on both sides, but it tends to be females that do the choosing. And that's one of the explanations for why here we've got American barn swallows. And you'll find that barn swallows are distributed almost all over the world, except for places like the polar regions. And yet there's a lot of geographic variation across the world in barn swallow populations in terms of what they look like. So these American barn swallows are really reddish in front, but if you looked at a European barn swallow, you'd find that it's pure white underneath, and it's got a much longer tail. And there's, there was a really classic animal behavior experiment um, done quite a few decades ago, where people cut off the ends of barn swallow male tails and glued them on to other males. So you had experimentally lengthened tails and experimentally shortened tails. And then they looked at who had the most children. And 
they used that as a proxy for basically who was the most, most attractive. And this, this includes both offspring with the female that the male is mated to, as well as extra pair offspring. And essentially the males, the European males that were, had the longest tails had the most offspring. So they were the sexiest, right, to those females. Um, but what's interesting is when, you, when people repeat that experiment in North America, they didn't find that pattern at all. And it turns out that in North America, the females are not really going for tail length. They're going for how red the male is in front. And that jives very well with the geographic variation we see in the differences in plumage in um, different barn swallow populations. So that's quite a cool example of how sexual selection can shape the, the different appearances of birds in different parts of the world. And to take that a step further, we found from experiments with black grouse, which are a chicken relative, um, re relative of all the grouse in North America as well, that the females sometimes have a rule of thumb about who to follow. So they will, actually follow fashions. So you can create a black grouse heartthrob. So I should ex step back and explain that grouse, like uh, a, lot of, a lot of grouse species, put, form what we call leks, which are essentially performance grounds, like stages, for all the males to gather and display to, to all the females. And the females essentially patrol this area and decide who to mate with. And it's a winner-takes-all mating situation. So one male tends to get 99% of the matings and everyone else is just, that's that for them for that season. And um, it turns out that you can stack the decks in, fa in favour of a particular male by arranging a few dummy stuffed grouse females around him to make him look more popular than he actually is. And that causes other females to, to just flock over and think, oh, this, this guy must be good because there are other females interested in him. So that seems to be a rule of thumb that some birds use to choose mates. This is just another grouse species. This is a sharp-tailed grouse, so it's a North American species. And um, you'll see that all the grouse have these fantastic, like other chicken species, fantastic um, skin ornaments that they tend to display. And the sharp-tailed grouse is especially fun because he does a little pirouette when, he, when he's doing this display dance. And this is a dusky grouse, um, which I was charging me. So they also get, the males get very territorial when they're during the breeding season. Uh, to cut back from that, there's, this, is a non, this is an Australian example of quite a common backyard bird in Australia. And in this case, the males will often use flower petals to display to females, which I thought was a really fun courtship routine. Uh, but quite tellingly, the males only display with flower petals to females that they're interested in ex engaging in extra pair relationships with. So they don't bother with their social mate, the, the kind of the, the female with whom they actually rear chicks and um, contribute food to. They do this to neighboring females. And biologists were quite surprised about, you know, when, when all this extra pair copulation is happening. But with DNA fingerprinting, the same that we do with humans, people have been finding out over the last few decades that a large majority of birds, especially small songbirds, are not what we call genetically monogamous. So they they have these extra pair of flings all the time and they just um, pair up socially to, to rear the offspring, but everyone's having affairs with everyone else essentially. So um, superb fairy wrens are the Guinness Book of Records winners for this so far. At least two thirds of most chicks, uh, most nests are fathered by males other than the female's actual social mate. Um, I also talk about bird song quite a bit, uh, but I won't, I won't talk too much about it here because that's such a well-discussed topic in many situations. I'll just, I've just got this bird, a white-crowned sparrow over here because uh, there was a really interesting paper which 
came out, of course, after my books. Um, I wish I'd had a chance to put it in, which is this interesting example of how after, during the pandemic, because of lockdown, there was so much less noise pollution in the Bay Area that the, this particular bird, especially the white crowned sparrow, um, could basically drop the, the volume of its songs to communicate to other birds. And uh, they could also include more information in their songs. So it's just an example of how urbanization has had a huge effect on how birds communicate and how they breed and that they can quite quickly reverse as individuals the, the effects of that kind of noise pollution if you just give them a chance like during the COVID pandemic. So that's been very striking and should be quite heartening as, a, as one of the nicest side, side effects of the pandemic. Um, I do talk a little about long-term pair bonds and the benefits of that. And one of my favorite examples of that is, of course, the raven, because it's just such an intelligent bird. A, sad, a sadder um, downside, or a sort of slightly darker example of how smart they are, as well as how pair bonded they can be, is that older, more experienced couples will actually keep track of budding younger couples who might pose a threat if they become established territorial couples and the older couples will preferentially sabotage the budding relationships of these young couples. Um, so they're, they're quite strategic. There's quite a lot of politics going on among ravens. And then uh, another of my favorite birds, this is a vulturine guinea fowl. These are from places like Kenya, arid parts of Kenya. I just put these in because it just shows that even if you have a chicken brain, you can keep track of several, several tens of individuals in your bigger social group. And these birds, they, you know, they run around in flocks of about 90 birds often, but it turns out that they have very distinct preferences about who to hang out within that larger flock and who to, who to sleep with and who to eat with. And so even the lives of chickens can be quite socially complex. And at the ultimate um, example of social complexity would be probably the last chapter of Bird Love, where we've got, where I focus on cooperative breeders or group breeders. And these acorn woodpeckers are an example of that in the sense that this kind of bird, um, so what they're doing in this picture is all those little circles are supposed to represent holes where the acorn woodpeckers have drilled bespoke holes to store in which to store acorns. And a, a single group will amass millions and millions of acorns, sometimes covering several trees, a whole stand of trees. And they tend to be cooperative breeders in California where they can do this and where it's worthwhile having a large group because it's essentially a public good that everyone's contributing to and helping to defend. And it makes reproductive sense in that environment because a larger group really does have more offspring than a smaller group of acorn woodpeckers. They, they're, and there are a lot of benefits. They help each other care for the eggs and chicks and they in a communal nest that they share. So you've got several pairs contributing eggs to a single nest hole. And also once those chicks are grown up, they disperse, but they form these gangs which then collectively collect and store and guard the acorn granaries. So um, it's, it's a sort of really group beneficial thing. Whereas in other parts of their range, the acorn woodpeckers either don't need to do this or don't seem to have the resources required to, to amass this number of acorns. And so you'll find that there are other populations of acorn woodpeckers that are not cooperative breeders. Um, and another example of a fairly flexible cooperative breeder is the Canada Jay, which if you, I think I, I first saw them driving all the way up to the boreal forests in Vermont, but they're fun because they, it's, it's like New York real estate. Um, if you grow up in this area that's just super saturated with very, very expensive housing and 
there's no room for a new couple to go anywhere and set up their own place to live. They sort of have to hang out at home and stay with their parents for a while. So we call that delayed dispersal. And very often delayed dispersers like these Grey Jays end up being cooperative breeders in the sense that they, they don't just delay dispersing, they delay reproduction. And you end up having these non-breeding helpers at the nest that uh, essentially, you could, you could almost think of it as two things. They're, they're paying indirectly to help their, their own parents' reproductive fitness by helping them babysit younger siblings. They're also, in a sense, paying to stay, by paying rent indirectly by you know, helping to store winter larder and helping to take care of with babysitting duties. Uh, so that's another explanation for cooperative breeders. And in terms of other sorts of care, of course, there's the, gosh, I don't know how to get rid of this top thing. Um, oh, well, anyway, this is a book from, uh, this is a page from Bird Love, but it's just to say that most of the birds we're familiar with, including the introduced starling, which was first introduced, the European starling was first introduced to New York, which is partly why I put it here. I'm sure some of you have heard the story about Shakespearean plays, birds mentioned in Shakespearean plays being introduced to Central Park, and this was one of them. But it's, it's quite fun to know that European starlings, if they can get away with it, the males, if they have extra nest holes available, will advertise, spend more time advertising to females and setting up multiple, multiple families in multiple nest holes, um, if the resources are available. So, so this brings up the question of who gets left taking care of the children. And you can see that, you know, many birds, if given the opportunity, there will be a conflict of interest between the parents as to who, who is left and who gets to try again with another partner. And just so you don't think this is pure stereotyping, I brought up, I wanted to bring up ostriches because they're related to a group of birds that we think might represent some of the earliest birds um, in evolutionary history. And in, in ostriches as well as other ratites, emus and cassowaries and rears and things like that, it's usually the males that perform most of the incubation, certainly, and some, a lot of the subsequent parental care. So it's very possible that paternal care fathers taking care of the offspring is what is the ancestral state in birds and what we might be more used to seeing in terms of songbirds where both parents care is is a more recently evolved state and if you look at a lot of shorebirds including these piping plovers or snowy plovers um, in other parts of the world and Kentish plovers you'll find that um, the, the, there's a sort of tug of war, battle of the sexes going on, where depending on the sex ratio of the population, it makes it easier for one sex to find a new partner than for the other sex. And very often this is, it's easier for the females to remate because there are relatively few of them compared to males. So if you think of this as a kind of mating market, it's just much easier for a female to find a new partner than for a male in a lot of these species. And when that's the case, the female can quite safely leave her eggs with her, her mate for him to incubate and go off and find another mate. And um, she gets a lot of reproductive benefit out of that. And in that case, we tend to see most, most of the only single parents around are males. And that's quite common to this species. So I just put that in as an example of how, especially if you've got what we call precocial offspring, these very independent, fluffy offspring, as opposed to the very naked pink um, chicks that you see with things like robins or starlings, that it's, it's okay for one parent, one parent's enough to take care of the kids. And so basically, whichever sex can take off first does. And um, this is an example of another precocial type of species, it's a common meganza, but a lot of ducks do this, where um, you'll notice that 
sometimes you you go around in the later breeding season in the in the summer and you'll find a female with something crazy like 20 ducklings swimming behind her and it's not it's not that they're all her children it's just that there's quite common cases of what we call egg dumping or within species brood parasitism where other females have just decided oh i've got a few extra eggs i'll just pop them in this other female's nest and so you end up with one one female with tons of hangers on you don't see this so much in um birds that are like the cysticlas i studied or any kind of songbird because those are so dependent on a lot of parental care that one parent just couldn't take care of that many extra kids but ducks get away with it a lot. And another, another type of just segueing to more of the chick rearing, you'll also find that parents have a few strategies up their sleeves evolutionarily for um, keeping, for, for hedging their parental bets. And one of the most common examples of this is various forms of um, siblicide almost. So, even, even if the chicks are not directly killing each other, they often starve each other out indirectly. And that's very common among birds of prey. So barn owls, for instance, you'll find that the runt of the, the runt or the runts of the brood are almost like insurance chicks. They'll, they'll make it if older eggs don't hatch. But otherwise, they hatch latest and they are the smallest. and chances are unless there's a huge glut of food they won't make it compared to their older siblings so that's that's really common among hawks and owls and um eagles it's also quite common among large um short sort of water birds like like these great blue herons and actually um your your magazine is egret the, the great egret is notorious for this because the great egret is what we call an obligate siblicidal species. So one, one twin always kills the other, uh, whereas at least great blue herons, they, they stand a bit more of a chance. So, so I, a lot of the books deal with a slightly darker side of family life, it's not just the sweetness and light. Um, this is more from understanding bird behavior. I tried to emphasize birds as individuals because we've got an increasing amount of research on that subject, not, not treating them as a sort of average of a population, but looking at individual personalities. And this is just one of the birds I got to know individually. Uh, his name is Valchi and he's an Egyptian vulture from Kenya. And one of the things I, one of the chapters in understanding bird behavior covers birds finding food and the different ways, the different adaptations they've got to doing that. And Valchi was the subject of one of the first examples of tool use in a non-primate species. And this is the kind of tools that Egyptian vultures employ. So they, they like eating ostrich eggs and it's hard work getting through to an ostrich egg. Um, the, the shells are surprisingly hard. So Jane Goodall and her then husband published a paper on how Egyptian vultures would use stones to, to crack open ostrich eggs, which is pretty fascinating. Um, another subject I talk about and, and cover is this idea of convergent evolution. So on the left, I've got two pictures of sunbirds, which are found in the old world, so Asia and Africa mostly. Whereas on the right, you've got hummingbirds. And they're completely unrelated. Hummingbirds are most closely related to swifts. And yet you'll see that this, you know, superficially very similar. They both feed on nectar primarily. And both, both are extremely small and fly very fast and very colorful as well. But the um, specific research that I try to highlight is also... So one thing I try to do in these books is highlight research by um, non-mainstream people. So more females and more non-white people. And, and also not, I try not to focus only on people from, uh, or research done on 
America and Europe. But in this particular case, it was um, a friend of mine from graduate school who was interested in how birds like hummingbirds and sunbirds might find nectar rewarding. And it turns out that most birds don't even taste sweetness because there's no incentive for them to do so. But for birds that subsist purely on nectar or largely on nectar, it's really important, right, to, to find sweetness attractive. It's, it's like humans finding hamburgers attractive because we, we evolved where things like fat and salt were really rare in the environment, but very important for us. And so she looked at the molecular evolution of the sweet taste bud receptor in these birds, and she found out that it turns out most birds don't have this a functional copy of any taste receptor that, taste, that, that is sensitive to sweetness, but that in hummingbirds, they essentially took a copy of the gene that's for umami, which is the receptor for things like soy sauce or meat, and made a, there, there were a couple of mutations in that gene, and that created is now the receptor for hum how hummingbirds taste sweetness. So that's a really fun example of convergence, both at the larger morphological and sort of ecological strategy level in terms of what the birds feed on, as well as potentially at the molecular level, if she can find out if other birds like sunbirds have a similar tweak, molecular tweak or not. Um, I also talk about mutualisms in terms of feeding. So here we've got partnerships where we've got red-billed oxpeckers on an African Cape buffalo, and they really like the ticks on the buffalo, but there are times when the mutualism goes a bit sour. This is back to the light and dark theme. So you've got this nice partnership where the birds are getting food because they're eating ticks and they're ridding the buffalo of parasites and everyone, everything's hunky-dory. Uh, the slightly darker side to the story is that the birds are not above having a little extra peck at the wound and having some blood along, alongside as a sort of chaser to the ticks. So there, there's always this interesting tension between when you have a partnership that's cooperative and when it turns parasitic, whether that's a breeding partnership or, or like a purely exchange food partnership in this case. And here's the North American equivalent, the brown-headed cowbird on an American bison. And um, these are both males, but I just wanted to highlight the cowbirds as to come full circle to my initial, um, some of my initial research in Africa. Cowbirds are of course, um, one, the only North American example really of an avian brood parasite where the parent species, the parents of the parasite species don't, they have no clue how to make nests, they don't, they don't do any childcare, they outsource everything. And this Kirtland's warbler is one of the biggest examples of how that's created huge conservation challenges in North America, because what happened with human development is the brown-headed cowbird turned from a Western bird of the prairies and the plains to um, expanding all over the Northeast and Southeast of North America. And in that situation, you end up with these host birds like this Kirtland's warbler that are completely evolutionarily naive to the parasites. So that's, you know, very similar to when the COVID pandemic hit. We were totally an, um, a naive host population. Our immune systems have evolved zero defenses to this. Very susceptible. Similarly, the Kirtland's warbler and a lot of other warblers in um, the Northeast had never evolved to, to, to cope with this kind of parasite. And so they will do things like, I mean, I think a Kirtland's warbler would probably sit on a golf ball and incubate that if you left it in the nest. They, they have evolved no behaviors that allow them to recognize a foreign egg and try to do something about it. Whereas if you find, if you look at birds that have co-evolved with brown-headed cowbirds, they have several strategies for getting rid of a cowbird egg and, and avoiding the costs of rep, um, losing all their own children in a reproductive season and rearing, spending a lot of resources rearing this kid that's just not theirs. Uh, but 
in Michigan, people have just had to, you know, the Kirtland's Wobbler has made this wonderful comeback largely through in human intervention to, to reverse the effects of existing human intervention that caused the, such problems for the Kirtland's Wobbler in the first place. So at least that's a nice conservation success story. Um, here's a, another example of a brood parasite. So you'll see on the bottom right, this uh, rather terrifying monster looking chick. It's a great honey guide. And this is practically a newly hatched chick, but you'll see that it's got these amazing uh, hooks for, on its bill. And it uses them to either stab all the other eggs in the nest if it hatches first, or if there are other chicks in the nest, it will use this to stab them and worry them to death so that it kills all the competition and becomes the only child. Um, and, and the cute Muppet-like things are little bee-eating fledglings. So that's, that's what would hatch very often from a host nest if, if there were no honey guides parasitizing. If there were, then it's, it's not good news. There's basically no, no little bee-eater chicks would make it. So that, that's an example of what we would call a really virulent brood parasite, as opposed to the brown-headed cowbird, which doesn't kill everyone. It just, it might kill everyone indirectly through starving them and outcompeting them, but it doesn't, doesn't have anything as drastic as this beak hook. Uh, so that's the dark side of greater honey guides. But the much nicer side, and the reason they're called honey guides, is they also have this fascinating mutualistic relationship with humans. And so this is a photograph of a Mozambican honey hunter. And there have been generations of people in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa who work with these honey guides. And they use the honey guides to find honey. And the honey guides use the humans as a way to get the beehive down, subdue the bees, and provide all this wax, which is what the honey guides are after. So it's a, it's a fascinating mutualism because the honey guides actually produce at least two types of calls. One that signals the distance from, well, one that just calls attention to the humans and says, I know where the honey is. And another that signals how far the humans are from the honey. And it's amazing that culturally, both sides have seemed to be able to pass this information down. And it's another example of how urbanization and changing livelihoods has, has been a bit sad because it's caused a lot of people to stop doing this honey hunting. And so you'll find that there are a lot of populations of honey guides in sub-Saharan Africa that don't really know how to signal to humans because they're humans that don't really know how to listen to them. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating system and it would be lovely to know more about how the honey guides actually learn to communicate with humans. We, we just don't know enough yet. Uh, there's also a lot of examples of birds communicating with each other. So this is just an example of a Japanese tit eavesdropping on other Japanese tits that might be sounding an alarm. And the birds actually have distinct alarm calls for dis distinct types of predators so that the listener doesn't do the wrong thing, say fly out of the nest when it's an aerial predator that's going to swoop down, or, or stay put if it's a snake that's going to come in and get the mother bird and her chicks. And um, one of the last things I talk about in the second book is migration. And so here we've got a white stalk pair and so these are the stalks of the carrying babies to people fame. But it's on the right is the really striking image, right? And it's an African spear through the neck of a stalk that even though it was speared, managed to migrate all the way from Africa in the winter back to its, where it nested in Germany. And so this is one of the earliest pieces of evidence of migration for, for Europeans to, to know that birds didn't just do things like bury themselves in mud or turn into barnacles or something, but that they actually moved all the way from Africa. Um, and it's just unfortunate that this poor bird survived an African hunter just to be shot down in Germany, but there are a few of these examples in different museums in Germany, which are just fascinating. And of course, now we've got 
much better ways of tracking birds than sticking spears in them. We've got um, all sorts of GPS devices and things like that, which I allude to as well. And I just wanted to end on this note of how it's really important that we all um, do our part for the natural world. And for me, it's the fascination has always been through birds. So I think what I try to do through my books is get people interested in the natural world, such as these fantastic migrations by snow geese. I took this photo in Montana, but I remember seeing them at, in marshes on New Jersey. And it's just a fantastic sight, especially in a place as urban as coastal New Jersey. And so anything we can do to help these birds along, whether it's reversing climate change or providing um, the necessary corridors and migratory fly, fly, um, flight routes that they need, is, is something that's worth doing. And it's great that everyone in Audubon is so supportive of this. Um, and with that note, just enjoy the spring migration that's coming up. I took this photo in Massachusetts, but it's just early spring when I took this yellow warbler. And um, if there are any, I, I, I guess I have more photographs and things on my website, wenfei.tong.com. And if you have any uh, questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Wenfei, for, for joining us this evening. Um, we have some time for questions, everyone. So if you have a question for uh, Dr. Tong, please put it in the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, you should be able to find it down there and we'll try to get to your questions. Um, so let's see, we have, we have some questions coming in. <laughs> okay. um, let's, let's try to find a few. Well, uh, here's a good one to start on and uh, maybe a tough one to answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Luis would like to know if you have a favorite, um, I guess, bird or um, mating, <laughs> mating habits. Oh, yeah. sorry, you probably know, I don't, you, you probably <laughs> notice, I, I, I think I might have said I, this is my favorite something or other multiple times in the talk. It's, it's a bit like being asked what your favorite book is or something. There are lots. Um, it's, it's, yeah. Probably whatever I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> I, that, that's actually usually what I say when people ask me my favorite bird is whatever bird I just saw. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, someone would like to know, oh, uh, what camera and lens you use uh, for your photo? Oh, you say oh, they're thank you. photographs. Yeah. Um, I, I used a Nikon D90 for a long time. And now I've got a Nikon D7100. And um, it's the same lens. It's a, uh, oh, it's the, gosh, can I remember this? Eight, 80 to 400 millimeter. It's, it's not wonderful, but I do a lot of cropping. And um, it's, it's mostly good luck that I get to the right place at the right time and can take a photo. But it's, it's, it's yeah, not the best setup. Um, let's see, this one's a little long, but I think it might be interesting. Let's see. Um, so, uh, Bobby says, I have a couple feeders on my patio and I've noticed that sometimes birds gather in groups, but other times they show up in pairs. In that, in these cases, one bird will usually eat at the feeder while the other waits nearby. It almost seems like one is standing guard while the other is eating. Is it possible that these birds are mates? Yeah, it's a great question. And very often I, I would say it, it is entirely possible. It would be fun to know which ones they are, that um, like if there's a difference between the species where they are in a big group and everyone's just eating all the time versus the ones that take turns. But there was a lovely study, which I think I talk about in Understanding Bird Behavior, um, on great tits, which are related to chickadees, but they're like the um, European equivalent, where they looked at mated pairs and they manipulated the bird feeders such that essentially the pairs either had the choice of staying together, but only 
one bird would get to feed at a time versus if they split up, they would both get more food and they would choose to stay together. Mm. Um, so that, that would be consistent with the idea that the ones you're seeing, you know, one, one might just be guarding or taking a break or whatever, but it's more important to some of these mated pairs to stay together than to both be guzzling. <laughs> Um, Which is very sweet. The most unusual mating practice you have uh, observed. Oh, well, yeah, I didn't. I, I hesitate to bring this up in the main talks because because it's so awful. But um, I, I remember being very traumatized by a, um, a duck rape, essentially, which mm. some of you might witness at some point. Uh, I remember I was waiting for a production of Macbeth in Stratford upon Avon, and it was this very bucolic scene on the Avon where you know everyone was picnicking and it was high summer, and then there was this scrum of ducks that are uh, like thirty thirty males, and I couldn't figure out why they were churning the water so vigorously, and and then I saw that there was one female. Trying to trying to surface under the, these males, um, but most of the time she was just being pinned down and she was diving to get away from them. And I had no idea at that time what this was what was going on. I, I just remember running along the bank screaming at the ducks because, you know, they would continue down the river and every male on the banks would join in. So so this grew to at least twenty or twenty ducks, twenty more ducks would join in and. It was just so awful to watch, and um, I subsequently found out that a few a few years later, I think uh, a, a biologist called Patty Brennan did some of her research on on this issue, and it turns out it's a it's a very very graphic example of sexual conflict in any species. I mean, insects have a lot of this, but in birds, it was particularly graphic or striking. And so um, ducks are among the few birds that have external genitalia. Most birds just touch these little holes that they call cloacas, um, which is what snakes and lizards tend to have as well. And so they don't have an intermittent organ, but ducks do. And it looks like the, there's a distinct correlation between the duck species that have a lot of this conflict going on and the length of the the phallus, the duck's phallus, and also the corresponding, there's, there's co-evolution. So this is a bit like the sort of arms race you see between brood parasites and hosts where one gets better and better at discriminating, uh, detecting a new egg, a foreign mm -hmm. egg, and so the other gets evolutionarily better and better at making a forgery. In this case, the males, um, phallus gets longer and longer evolutionarily so the female's vagina gets longer and longer and more and more it has dead ends and things so that the male can't artif um, can't forcefully inseminate her if she's not interested um it's just like a inbuilt evolutionary evolutionary chastity belt almost mm. but it does it does cost the females um quite a lot to to have this happen anyway sorry this is kind of a dark <laughs> Look, answer. Well, in, in your answer, actually, it brings me to another question because you mentioned um, birds, you know, being able to recognize, you know, eggs that aren't their own. And yeah. someone asked, um, are birds able to sp spatially recognize that an egg is the wrong size for their nest or the wrong color? It's a great question. Um, there isn't much evidence about the spatial idea for the spatial idea but the color for sure um so so in especially in species that have been experiencing parasitism for many generations um they do notice if the egg doesn't match either in color or in pattern or both which is partly what i was um studying i was looking at the Gen genetic basis of these different colors and patterns because uh, a single female always lays the same pattern and color on her eggs. And so you need to get 
the right combination of genes for her to evolve a new color and pattern. And there's some species where the arms race has been going on for long enough that the host bird is related to that one with the pretty grass nest that I showed you. Um, some of those host species have evolved colors that the parasite cannot match yet. And so th that's a surefire way of knowing that it's, it's a forgery and <laughs> rejecting the egg. It's very cool. Um, in terms of size, some of them, some of them definitely can. There's definitely selection. So, um, for instance, the common cuckoo is much larger than most of its hosts, but it lays a very small egg for its size as a bird, mm. and that's probably to match the size of the host eggs. And the common cuckoo is another example of a very old evolutionary relationship between the parasite and the hosts. Um, how birds actually learn, and there's, there's also some evidence that some of them, some birds can count. So if there's the wrong number of eggs in the nest, that's another cue to reject the parasite eggs. Or to, wow. to, if they can't, and another, one of the problems is the host birds are often so small that it's really hard for them to get rid of these parasite eggs, even if they know which egg it is, and even if they want to get it out. Like, they can't physically do it properly. Mm. And in those cases, they will do things like abandon the nest and start all over, which is costly, but not as bad as losing all your kids to the parasite in the, the whole breeding season. At least you're just losing eggs. You're not losing chicks and months of, or weeks of feeding. Um, yeah, and one of the coolest examples is the yellow warbler. So the last photo I showed was of a yellow warbler. And that species often builds a new nest level. It's like a little multi-story nest. So it'll just build a new nest on top of the existing one to cover up the first layer of eggs. And there are these fantastic um, specimens from museums of nests that are seven or eight layers of, you know, you can see in every layer there's a cowbird egg. And so that poor yellow warblers made a new <laughs> nest on top of it and they tried again and that cowbird came back and um, laid another egg. Determined, persistent and <laughs> determined. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we have so many good questions. I'm sorry, people. Um, we I, are I'm giving you long answers. Time. Yeah. But um, if I don't know. Someone did ask, and I, you know, I know this is sometimes a difficult question to answer, especially right now. Um, but do you have anything you're currently working on that you're excited about, or any future? Oh, yeah. Ben? Yes, um, I am. So, so you'll notice that I've done quite a lot of stuff. I, I'm it's a lot of my photos keep focusing on Kenya, Zambia, and Montana. And so, what I'd really like to do is. Um, I'm trying to focus on a book that talks about grasslands and sustainable ranching, especially on rangelands in these three places, uh, focusing on three families that I've made friends with while doing field work in these three places. And of course, I'll take a bird's eye view, so I'll do a lot of this from the perspective of what it means for birds in those places. But um, it, it's going to be less photo heavy and more of a narrative and it, I'm hoping it will be a bit of a travelogue meets. Um, I'll, I'll use the stories about the people and the landscapes to, to explain the ecology and evolution and the conservation. Um, yeah, that's the current project. Well, that, that sounds very interesting and everyone, I'm going to put a couple more links back in the chat for you all. So links to find both of Dr. Tong's books, but also a link to her website. A lot of you asked about her drawings and her photographs. You can find all of that on her website um, and along with all sorts of other stuff because she actually does a million different things. So you can <laughs> think. I, I, um, I'm one of those people who doesn't know what I want to do when I grow up, right? <laughs> yes, but it's, it's wonderful. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. It's oh, thank you. Able to well, have thanks you. Thanks everyone for the questions. They're so good. 
And I think a lot of people wanted a lot more details about specific things. And I met. Yeah, I, I'm, that, that, that will be in the books. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't um, yeah. Probably less is more, but I was doing a Huobin thing. Yeah, that's what I figured. So yeah, everyone, if you if you had a specific question we didn't quite get to, I would say try to check out those books. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll find what you what you were hoping for in there. Um, and there was a quick question about whether or not the video can be yes. um, watched again. Um, yeah, I mean, we are hoping we have been recording. So okay. hopefully we will be able to put that up on New York City Audubon's a YouTube channel and um, we'll link to it on our lecture page on our website so you should be able to find it there. Um, okay well thank you again um, for joining us. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our last lecture of our series this winter. Thanks again to Claude and Lucien Bloch for um, making this possible um, and I hope everyone has a good evening and maybe we'll see you next month at our special pale mail lecture. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions. Yes. Yes. Thank you all for your great yeah. questions. Take Bye. care. Bye everyone.